Salatu salam ala rasulillah ala alihi wa sahbihi sallim sallim kathira Welcome everybody to tonight's session inshallah ta'ala on Friday Night Lights Obviously as most everybody knows we had a different session that was planned for today But due to the tragedy that happened um, in North Houston yesterday um, We felt it appropriate to change the topic um, and to discuss this issue of when, when tragedy strikes and processing tragedy, processing grief through faith. And so we have obviously our, our, our regular panel here, Sheikh Urid and Sheikh Kamal. Welcome, Mashaikh. Um, and I, I wanted to just begin with the, the topic of, of um, the, the nature of calamities that happen. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَلَنَّبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَفْسٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالْثَمَرَاتِ Allah says that we will test you. And so when these tests happen, and Allah mentions that we'll test you with uh, a portion of fear and hunger and the loss of, of wealth and the loss of selves, uh, the loss of life and, and the loss of fruits, and he says, and give glad tidings to the patient. Those who, when they experience a hardship, a calamity, they say, inna lillahi wa inna rajiun. So, Sheikh, if you could, uh, we can begin with Sheikh Lee, just with regards to... How about before that? Yeah. Just, um, because the Houston audience knows what happened, but just very briefly. Sure. For, if you could, because we have audiences overseas, and then months from now, people won't understand what you're talking about. But I love, maybe give us a brief, but I love what you, you were just saying, that a lot of information is not out there yet about what happened. But people, mashallah, are filling in the blanks with all kinds of crazy stories. So, Fadlan. I mean, this, so far what we know is that we have a sister, Sister Sadia Manzoor, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on her. Uh, she was killed. Uh, her daughter was killed. Her four-year-old daughter was killed. As well as her mother was killed. Uh, by her ex-husband. And so those are the facts on the ground as far as the, the causes. And the ex-husband killed himself. And he killed himself. So it was a murder-suicide. Um, murder uh, it was a murder-suicide. And it's an incredible tragedy. And this is a sister who is uh, an Islamic school teacher, someone who's very known to the Champions community. Most of the people from our community know her. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on her. And so it's an incredible tragedy. That's the event that uh, you know, the entire Houston community is processing right now and dealing with. And so that's what inspired this particular topic, when tragedy strikes. Yeah, and so Sheikhna, as far as the issue of calamities, if you could talk about the issue of calamity and how we are to respond, the, the different categories of, of ways that people respond to calamities. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man walahu ba'd. Uh, first of all, uh, my condolence and, and prayer for uh, the sister's family and her mother's family and to all of us that uh, calamities uh, can impact people who are not necessarily to be relatives, but friends, but people feeling that uh, it's part of the community. And one brother was telling me this uh, uh, morning, he said, yeah, I couldn't sleep in the night. I'd just been looking at the picture of this young girl and like, you know, uh, think about my own daughter, think about my, my family, you know. Uh, just sudden death is, uh, death in general is a calamity, is a, is a scary thing. So for it to happen all of a sudden unexpected, it's, it's very hard also losing like a, a mother, a daughter, and a granddaughter. Three generations. Three generations, generations, like just that one uh, sunless, sunless killing. Um, it, 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 sometimes it's hard for people to process this. So uh, definitely this is something not easy, not something uh, hard. But uh, as I said today in my khutbah al Jumu'ah, six years ago from like now, there's another incident happened to another Muslim sisters also. Uh, her ex uh, murdered her two daughters and then killed himself. You know, uh, and it was a mental health, uh, mental health issues, as well as this incident, a uh, lot of reports that you've been here, that the person was uh, mentally ill. So, um, this uh, notion of murder suicide happens a lot in the in the U.S. Texas actually leads with 67 cases a year of murder suicide. Yeah, 
Um, in Clear Lake here, we had once uh, a woman murder her four kids. Yeah. Uh, in the bathtub or something like that. Yeah. She, she like murdered them and she killed herself. You know, and SubhanAllah, uh, uh, also this person who killed his own children six years ago, he shot himself, but he didn't die. Yeah. The bullets go th went through his head and he survived and he's spending the rest of his life in jail. Mm. That's like a double punishment to see your own actions. Um, in any way, um, so talking about this tragedy, uh, uh, there is any calamity that strike you. People, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said people are, have four levels or four different ways of response. One of them is terrifying and yajza wa yafza, he terrified, he's like frustrated, panic. anger, panic. And those people really will not, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said and others said, will not gain anything from this except more fear, more sadness, and uh, more suffering. And that's not what we've been ordered to do when calam calamity strike. Uh, the second level, or second group, are the one when calamity strike them, they have patience, sabr. And he said, وَهَذَا أَقَلُّ الْوَاجِبُ وَهُوَ حَالُ الْعَوَامِ And that's what is obligated upon every Muslim. That's the basic, that to be patient. What patient he means? حَبْسُ nafs to control your reactions. You remember the story of the woman who, when she lost her husband and the Prophet ﷺ came, and he said, be patient. Then she said, stay away from me. She just like, stay away from me. You didn't lose what I lost. She didn't recognize him. Right? Yeah, yeah, she didn't know who he is. Then after she left, they told her, by the way, this was the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. She said, oh my God. Then she ran to see where he at. And she found two guards or two people guarding the, the door. And she said, please, Ya, ya Rasulullah, I want to talk to the Prophet I'm sorry, I didn't recognize you. Then the Nabi Sallallahu said, إِنَّمَا الصَّبْرُ عِنْدَ الصَّدْمَةِ الْأُولَى yani The true meaning of patience, that's the first moment, your first response, when you heard that uh, uh, news. It means yani, your full reward for your patient will happen based on how you first res your first response. So that's the second level, to be patient with it, to control so patience your means that control means that I don't say anything that goes Displeased against the Displease Allah decree. subhanahu wa ta'ala, doubting the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not saying why God, why, God yeah. was unfair, this, I don't deserve this, exactly. like these types she of phrases. She doesn't deserve that, she's like, this is before her time, blah, blah, all those kind of things. Okay. Oh, even thoughts like that. And the third... The wailing, the beating of the, yeah, the, the wailing, different cultures like, that people absolutely. have. Absolutely. Yeah, but okay. it's not against it to be sad. It's not against it to feel bad. It's not against sabr to even cry. That's not against patient. And Nabi Sallam cried when his son died, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was sad. I'm sad over your death, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, <clears throat> the third uh, one, which is basically another level, which is a rida A rida is to be content with what Allah have decreed upon you. And there is a debate, is being content and fully accepting what Allah have decided, is that wajib or highly recommended? There is a debate between the scholars upon that. I lean towards that the basic of it, the, the, the minimum of it is wajib. That to have to be content and to say alhamdulillah for everything. And you know what, I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always do the best. Having that, processing that, it's, an, it's a higher level. Then there's even higher level than all this. قَالَ بِنَ الْقَيِّمْ رَحِمَ اللَّهِ وَهَؤُلَاءِ الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمُ مُصِيبَةِ شَكَرُ وَحَمَدُ اللَّهِ They are grateful and thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and realizing that in every calamity there is something good. No matter how evil this calamity is, there will be always something good. So you are thankful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow you to see that good and to utilize it. And if there is nothing good in calamity, except, if there is nothing good in calamity, except that it gives you opportunity to be patient, to have sabr, that's enough. Because Allah says, إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ That 
Allah will give reward to those who are patient with no limit. There's no limit to the amount of reward that they get. It's not 10 times 700 times. It's, 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 it's way unlimited. more than that. Also, uh, uh, sabr has great, great yani, uh, reward for it. So if this is the only thing, that's why Umar said something very beautiful. He said, If Allah takes away from you something so dear to you, a friend, a family, health, wealth, whatever, took it away from you. That's Umar is saying that. Then Allah gave you patience, sabr. What have he given you is way more better than what he's taken away from you. Which is the sabr, the patience that you have, and the control that you have over yourself, is way more beneficial to you than whatever you lost. So I hope this is something that we can reflect upon, and we grow in this, it's not easy to reach that level, the, th the fourth level. But as we go and we try and we train ourselves and we try to figure it out, uh, 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 that's something that it should be, you know, uh, uh, hopefully it will help. I'll just, I don't want to take too much time, but the brother was talking to me yesterday, he was telling me, uh, today, this morning, he said, Sheikh, I couldn't sleep, I'm the only one that bothered me the most is the baby, you know, the child, the four years old. I said, that's the only one I'm not worried about at all. Then he said, he kind of paused. I said, she is in Jannah, straightforward, nothing. Yani, that's the, the best. <laughs> yani, if there is any best part of it, just straight in Jannah. And she will intercede for her mom. And she, yani, mm -hmm. That's the best part of it for me. For us as a Muslim, I don't see life end at death. So that's my point, that you can find in the trial something to say, Allah, Alhamdulillah. You don't know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala planned things. You don't know how this will play in the day of judgment. It could be that child who's the reason to save the mother and to save so many of the family members. Who knows? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, we know that he's merciful. We know that he's kind. We know that he allowed things to happen even if it is cruel and bad like this, but for a greater wisdom. Maybe that's another point to discuss, but that's just to, to allow you to comprehend and to understand when the scholar said there's a level of shukr, how can be, or hamd, and a better uh, word to be used here. You know, I wanted to add something uh, I always say about sabr. Patience is, uh, being patient is difficult. And because it's difficult, People don't like to hear that as a solution. And someone comes to you, Sheikh, I've got this problem, and I've got this and this issue and that issue. And then you listen to him carefully, patiently, and then you tell him, be patient, inshallah. He gets so frustrated. Like, I came all the way here for you to tell me, be patient, I already know that. Give me steps, A, do this, B, do that. And there's some things though, there's no solution but patience. But people, because they don't like the idea of being patient, that it's painful, it's difficult, they don't want to hear that, you know? Um, yani this is a true story. This guy came to a, an imam friend of mine. He said, Sheikh, give me a dua to make me patient because I don't want to wait for it. <laughs> yani just, he said it in one sentence like that. I don't want to wait to be patient. <laughs> Let's speed this thing up. The point is that, I, I love the, the ayat here where uh, in Surah Al-A'raf, if I'm not mistaken, where Fir'aun says, قَالَ سَنُقَتِّلُ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ وَنَسْتَحِي نِسَاءَهُمْ وَإِنَّا فَوْقَهُمْ قَاهِرُونَ الآخر, He said, we're going to kill their sons, we're going to spare their women, and we're, we have dominance over them, we're masters over them. Then the next verse, قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ اسْتَعِينُوا بِاللَّهِ وَاصْبِرُوا Musa says to his people, just seek the assistance of Allah and be patient. Type, he didn't give them steps, we're going to hide the sons, we're going to hide the... He didn't give them anything, there's nothing to do, we have no power. The only solution is patience. So sometimes, yeah, that's the only solution, and it's difficult, but it's also the best solution. So now, we're not saying all of this as a, like, this is the, the only aspect of this discussion that needs to be had. For so. Sure. We were talking, even as we were discussing about this Friday Night Lights, it's like, okay, are we going to talk about domestic violence? Because that needs to be addressed. 
are we going to talk about mental illness because that needs to be addressed. And as a community, these are things, and alhamdulillah, we've already discussed these issues both in khutbahs and Friday Night Lights as a community. Sheikh Walid in Ramadan, he talked about us, alhamdulillah, hiring uh, a, a, a sister dedicated to mental health counseling here in the masjid. Like these are, these are all issues that need to continuously be addressed by our community. That being said, inshallah ta'ala, in future Friday Night Lights, we hope to have experts to come and to join us to discuss these issues in, from, from, from an expertise angle as well. But that being said, Sheikh Kamal, we also, um, when we're talking about patience, there's also the aspect of preparation, right? There's also the, the aspect of engagement. There's also the act of being proactive. Absolutely. In, in another word, Sheikh Kamal, a lot of people don't like the word patience sometimes. It's not because they don't want to be patient, but because they think when you say be patient, it, look, it seems to be like do nothing. It's passive. Passive. You're just sitting and, and wait. Is that, is that what patience means? I want steps. Means? Yeah. Is, that, is that what it means, being having sabr or patience? Uh, is that means, uh, or patience, it means that doing nothing? Yeah, I don't know if people... That's why I don't like translating sabr as patience only. Huh. When you think of patience, patience seems very passive. But when you translate sabr as perseverance, perseverance is very active. Mm. When you translate sabr as endurance, it's very active. When you translate sabr as... How does that become ...as active? grit. Because it means that you have to outlast whatever obstacle comes your way. So there's an obstacle, it becomes a challenge, and I, ha I have to last longer than whatever this obstacle is. There's some resistance. It's active, there's resistance, there's nice. energy being consumed. Patience is kind of like, a, it just feels like you're just sitting like this. And so when it's like persevere, persevere means that I'm, you know, it's like that, it's like the verse, like I'm outlasting this individual that has that level of energy. So Ibn al-Qayyim, for example, said, uh, sabr, uh, the, the, the translation of what he said, he said, being patient or persevering, it doesn't mean that you become passive. Mm -hmm. He said, sabr also, it's your ability to adjust with the calamity. So that's something, doing something. Yeah. Like, okay, I lost a child, I lost my job, I lost money. You know, uh, we lost friends. So it doesn't mean I just stay put like that. No, it means I keep going. I'm moving on in my life. Okay, that's why part of a sabr in Islam, the Prophet said, you can three days maybe you cry over somebody and after that you should move on. So you lost. You know, you, still the memory there, but you don't stop. You know, so sabr it doesn't mean I just, part of a sabr is, for example, I, let's say, um, I'm sick. I have sickness. Part of being patient, it means that, or part of being patient is to work on trying medicines, going to the tech, taking the means, you know, doing the, the whatever it takes, you know. But in the same times, I will control myself from never doubting my God, never doubting the wisdom behind it. My ability to keep my calm, to keep my sense, that's important. But also it is important to realize what Sheikh Kamal just said. Sometimes it's about time too. You have to be able to, sometimes you don't have anything to change the outside, but you can change yourself to start being strong, building your own strength. So you can outlast that calamity. Does that make sense? But I, I have a question. I'm wondering if some people are, are curious, why are we starting with patience? Like, who are we referring to? Because my brain is going somewhere else. And, and since I heard of the, the news, I've been thinking about the mindset of the man who did all this. So when you're talking about patience, I'm completely applying it to him. Are you applying it to the family members, the survivors? Or to the community who are sad, who are crying? Or I was actually thinking of the community, yeah. I've been thinking about this guy. Yeah, be patient, man. Not just patience, a bunch of other things. But And maybe we're going to touch I, on I that. I don't understand your point. What causes a person to commit that crime? I always have this issue, you know. That's why I eat the stinky foods and stuff. I always try to put myself in the place of the other person. Like, Why do you like the stinky food? Or why do you eat this? So I'm thinking, like, what could drive a man to that point? 
where he could do something like that. Kill his own family. Yeah, and how do you, how do you murder your four-year-old? Yeah, the wife I can, okay, you know. No, no, I mean, it's not a, like a laughing matter, but, but, but I can understand many people kill their spouses. This is America, that's what I'm trying to say, okay? People kill their spouses all the time. I don't mean anything nasty here. But, like, the child. Mother-in-law, you know, there's all these kinds of things about the mother-in-law. There's already hatred, I understand. But how do you kill a four-year-old? So I've been just thinking about his state of mind this whole time. And part of it, in my Assum mind... Assuming there was a state of mind. Yeah, maybe there was just no brain. But, but I'm just thinking part of it is that there was a point where this person lost patience. You know? Yeah. No, well, what, I, what I understand that the person has a mental health issue. Yeah. Like he is uh, mentally not stable. Like, uh, and I don't mean that. What I'm understanding, he's diagnosed with that. He's been like, dealing with that. So that's part of the discussion too. I think it's important. Uh, Sheikh, yeah. you, you, you mentioned something that I want to harp on for a second. You said the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is three days, cry for three days and then move on. Person loses a, a loved one. Are they really going to move on in three days? Like are the they only going days, to, the Prophet the ﷺ himself, they call it Aam al huzn the year of grief when he lost his wife and he lost his, his uncle, right? First of all, it's weak. Right? Okay, it's weak. Uh, but even then, is it, is, it, is it understood that a person is going to lose a child or something and then in three days no, they're going to pick themselves up and move on? Feeling sad about lost someone, it can last with you for the rest of your life. Okay. But what the Prophet said, taught, don't cry. Like doing nothing but staying in a house and yeah. crying over the death well, of someone. Like That's paralyzed it, three days. Paralyzed. Like you can't anything. do that. More than three days, you're not supposed to do that. You have to fight yourself to move on and keep going. Because life, like I like what, uh, what his name, uh, Einstein said. He said, life is like riding a bicycle. The only way to keep balance is to keep going. Otherwise, right. you will lose balance. Right. And the only way to keep balance in life is to keep battling and keep going. Otherwise, you will lose balance in life. So same thing. It's, it's, a, it's the same concept. You know how in a lot of cultures, if a person dies, they'll literally camp out for weeks yeah. for this individual. That's part of what the so Islam it's, it's Islam is restricting it to three days. No, you know, three even three days. days. That's somebody at home crying, doing nothing but crying. But in Islam, we don't have anything like, you know, somebody die, khalas, the whole thing stopped, like system government, the whole country shut down 40 yeah. days because the, the king die or the president die. We don't have anything like that in Islam. You know, Omar die tomorrow, everything function in Medina. Rasulullah die, everything function next day in the Medina. Mm -hmm. You know, Abu Hamza die, everything function. Ibn, Ibn Abbas, an, he was traveling and he was told, by the way, your son died. He already left the, the city. Mm -hmm. He said he died. He went down, he prayed to Raqqa and he said, Istairu bi sabri wa salat. Seek aid and help in salah and sabr. Then he continued his journey. Khalas, there's someone else will bury my son. How I will meet him in Jannah? I move on. That's just another level of strength. Not expecting everybody to reach that level, but the concept at large is not to stop. It's to think. So for us as a community, when we hear about this tragedy, you know, I know we'll be sad, things like that, and we. Will, but I think we need to take the conversation a couple of days or weeks as a community. As a people who shot, okay, so what can we do in the future to protect families? What can we do with mental health issues in the, in the future? So it, it does, it, it happened a lot. It's not only to our community, to our society at large. I just want to harp on one thing, Sheikh. People already have a, a, a problem with loneliness. Like we already have this issue. And then when people go through a calamity like this, do we support the family for just three days and then just tell them, Khalas, it's only three days, get no, out? No, no. I remember th the reason why... Three days, just make sure. Three days, the Prophet I'm talking about someone who just weeping, crying all, all the time. He said, okay. don't, don't do that. The maximum you can do three days. That's it. Can you give condolences beyond the three days? Yeah, inshallah, 10 years. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, I was, I was said, not there. I was not there yeah. when so-and-so's yeah, yeah. uh, father that, died. Absolutely. So I come to the city and I go and I visit him and I give absolutely. him condolences. Yeah, in the, not only that. In Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, any calamity strike you and you remember it even later on, after a long time, a death of a husband, a death of a son, years. 
إلا أحدث الله له أحدث لها استرجاعا جديدا إلا أجره الله any time that you remember the calamity that happened years ago and you said إن لله وإن إليه راجعون and you show strength and patience Allah سبحانه وتعالى reward you again for it so even after years the point is that you don't let your sadness paralyze you it doesn't it does you don't stop you keep moving you keep going you keep growing that's the whole point Shaykhna, there's something I, I heard from uh, two mashayikh many years ago and it was very beneficial for me because, you know, growing up teenagers, kid, you think that being sad is a quality of the believer, you know, because there are calamities in Kashmir and calamities in Palestine. <laughs> First of all, that's only in Virginia. That's huh? the only, <laughs> it's only in Virginia where you guys had this. Probably. <laughs> but, but they were saying it's not from the attributes of the believer to be const uh, perpetually sad. And I think that's just very... Sadness uh, never mentioned in the Qur'an in a praise way. That's what they said also, yes. It's like Sahih. the man who said to Imam Ahmad, he said, Man araf Allah ta'ala huznu. Right? Like whoever knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah, th their, their sadness is extended. Was it Sufyan Thawri? And he said, responded to him and he said, Whoever knows Allah ta'ala farah, their, their happiness is extended, expanded. But that's very, it relieves this, you know, why should I always be like constantly, perpetually sad and stuff? It's very uh, relieving, I think, this. Uh, okay. I think it's important to realize that we're human beings. We're weak, we're, we're, we're vulnerable, and, and that's why we try to get that strength to, to deal with this. The most important thing is what's next. You know, how I'm gonna keep going, I'm gonna keep pushing, I'm gonna keep growing. You know, things knock me down on the ground, but how can I stand up again on my feet? Subhanallah, uh, Nabi uh, said, the example of the believer like the example of the palm tree. One of the beautiful things about palm tree, uh, palm tree, the, the wind comes, bend it, then it comes back, bounce back. It's not like, you know, any other trees where it doesn't break. Break. No, it bounce back. And one of the things about the believer, their ability to bounce back, to come back. And that I believe because I know, even if I don't see it with my eyes now, I know that there is a great benefit in this. If it's not me for them, it's not in this life, in the next life. So this is so important to keep. That's why the believers always deal with these issues while realizing that Allah has a greater wisdom. And not necessarily that I will recognize every wisdom Allah SWT has. It's impossible because in order for you to know the wisdom of God, you have to have similar knowledge. Because sometimes the wisdom has to do with the future. And you don't have knowledge of the future. It could to deal with something in the past. And you don't have knowledge of everything happened to the, in the past. You don't know. So that's what builds in you. You need to, to remember that you're dealing with the most just, fair. Wadud, Latif, Khabir, Alim, Rahim. All these qualities of God, merciful, wise, knowledgeable, uh, loving uh, God subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the theological questions that this, these types of events pose is they'll say, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do... It's very... People don't understand and appreciate when something bad happens to a bad person, but what happens when bad things happen to good people? But the answer to this question, and it's one that everybody here should know, the answer to that, because you will get asked that question at some point in your life. Someone will say to you, why do bad things happen to good people? If God exists, why do bad things happen to good people? And the answer to that is bad things don't happen to good people. Bad things do not happen to good people. Because the Prophet ﷺ says, The Prophet ﷺ says, Amazing is the affair of the believer. Everything that happens to the believer is good. And that is only for the believer. If something good happens to them, they're thankful, and that is better for them. And if something bad happens to them, they're patient, and that is better for them. And so the believer, through their interaction with the good and the bad, is able to transform everything they experience to being good. And so bad doesn't happen to them. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just as this last Ramadan, someone came to my office, a non-Muslim. And he's refusing to believe in God because he's saying, why do bad things happen to good people? And, you know, in the da'wah class, we always talk about 
the reverse of that is why do good things happen to bad people? You know, the guy robbed the bank, shot the security guard, got in the car, the cops crashed, he got away. But why do bad things happen to good people? I mean, good things happen to bad people. That's one. The other thing is, I tried to get him to understand. I mean, that's a good question. Why? Huh? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Destroying my argument. <laughs> um, the other thing is, like, one of the ways to get people to, out of uh, whatever uh, cycle of thought they're in is to ask them, okay, what would you like to happen? So I asked him, what would you like? And then he started describing al-Jannah to me, basically. And then I told him exactly, that's it. That's what you're describing is the next life. In this life, you slip and fall, you break an arm, you fall off a ladder. You have free will, which causes all of these things to happen. Absolutely. And it's like other people did it. Like, and if someone gets robbed, like, why God? Why did God do this to me? It was this guy. It wasn't God. It was this guy. You didn't see it. And always people like try to blame something. And him, for the point was that get, that's Jannah where nobody gets cut and falls and nothing bad happens. But this is earth. That's the nature of this life. Yeah. yeah. And, and the good thing is Allah reward, Allah God reward you for it if you have patience, if you have the belief. Uh, there is a hadith in Sunnah Abi Dawood. Um, I don't know about the authenticity of it, but the concept is authentic where the Prophet ﷺ said, that sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants a certain place for you in paradise. He wants to reward you tremendously. But your deeds does not take you that high. Whatever you're doing is not good enough to take you to that level. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does, He tests you with calamity. He puts you in hardship. Not only He puts you in hardship, and aid you, and help you, and open your heart to be strong, and your mind to be strong. He give you that aid and support. So because of your patience, Allah reward you so much to get to that level that He wants for you. And that answers another very popular question, which is, how do I know if this thing that's happening to me is a test from Allah to raise my ranks or if it's a punishment for my you know, sins or what have you? And so you simply say, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought you closer to him through this test, then it's to raise your ranks. It's, it's for this. Yeah, uh, if and, if you, and if you've just become more distant, then it's punishment for you. Yeah. And also, even if you had a, a sin that you commit and Allah punish you for your sin because of that, that's an ability for you to repent from this sin and to wipe it out. And by wiping it out, you go up high. Yeah. And you come closer to Allah. Without belief in Al-Akhirah, it would be very difficult to oh, process. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah just, absolutely. When you just have, you think you have one life, that's it. Then you lose a limb or you lose a loved one. That's the end of your life, and that's why many people they, you know, they get fired from a job, they kill themselves, all these kinds of things. But hundred percent, huh? I can't, I can't imagine myself living a life if I don't know that there is a next life. I don't know how human beings can live a life while they don't believe in hereafter. You need a lot of drugs and alcohol. I just, I don't understand how can you live that life. Because life will never go smooth. It won't be, I'm saying. You know, it's hard, it's, you know, uh, it, it just, it just, it, it, believing in the hereafter is what give you strength, would give you that uh, faith and, and strong strength to keep going. Abu Bakr has a statement where he says, لَا خَيْرَ فِي خَيْرٍ بَعْدَهُ النَّارُ وَلَا شَرَّ فِي شَرٍ بَعْدَهُ الْجَنَّةِ there's no evil in any evil that leads to paradise, and there's no good in any good that leads to the hellfire. So they're seeing everything through the frame of the hereafter. And when a person sees things through the, and that's that idea, right? The, the dua of, or the statement of, inna lillahi wa inna raji'un, whenever you experience a calamity that you say, it, it's immediate framing. That's what it does. It frames a person to realize, number one, that I'm, I and we all are the property of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he does with us what he wishes. He takes us away when he wishes. He takes our loved ones away when he wishes. And, it, and we belong to him. And so there's, there's no injustice that's being done. There's nobody who, who left before their time or she, you know. Allah doesn't wrong anybody. And number two is that we're returning back to Allah. You know, and when, you're re, when you believe that you're returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it inspires that incredible hope. No matter how worthless this dunya is, how vile, how oppressive, how all of these types of things, you're returning back to the ultimate judge, the most just, the most merciful. One of the things that I would like us to pay attention to as a community, when we lose something like a, fam a whole family died, 
that's also a test for us as a community. Are we ready to deal with something like this? It's my question will be, imagine if there is a sister or a brother left behind, an orphan. Is the community ready to take over? To absorb that person? To absorb that person. Is the community ready to take care of that problem? You remember the incident in New Zealand? Yeah, Christchurch. Christchurch. So one of the Mashiach, when he visited there in Christchurch, he told me the biggest challenge was the community now have maybe like 40 widows or 35 widows. What do they do with them? There is no saving enough money for them. Like they die young age, most of their husbands. You know, not preparing for it. Uh, they don't work. They don't have income. You know, so many of these women don't have a job. They were mothers just... Uh, 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 staying at home and you know the and now they have kids they have Christ how can you ch how can you take care of that large number of families in your community at one time you, you see so for, for example now when we hear things like this that will be something that go back do I have enough institutes do we have institute organizations in the community willing to step in and to take care of that's one two another test do we have enough support groups Okay, for from sisters to help the family of whoever left uh, uh, behind, the neighbors, the co-workers. This is a big crisis. We don't feel it here because the sister was not part of the master. But if she was, Allah forbid and protect you guys all, it will be a, a, a large, a, a huge, a, a bigger problem for us. So are we ready to deal with that? You know, these are good questions that we should start asking about, ourselves about it. And that's why I think, like, inshallah, in the, in the next month, when we start our sister group in the masjid, it, it really this something wake me up. I said, you know what? That's why it is important to have that kind of support groups inside the community to help those who go through crisis like that. Um, so these are good questions that we should ask ourselves and we start learning. That's what I say. You know, you start moving on and start seeing this as an opportunity for you to grow as a community, as, an, in, as individuals. Uh, there's many other things, but I will, I'll leave it for you guys to see what, what your thoughts as well. I, I want to bring up uh, like, uh, like safety issues, you know? Um, like if, because, where do we start, Yaki? But basically, if, uh, like if a sister, she gets divorced from her husband, all right? And a lot of times, uh, men can't don't handle a divorce well like i know of a sister she's been divorced from her husband for years this guy just opens the door and walks in she tells him yeah Falan, we've been divorced for years yeah. you can't just walk in like this he's like in denial but he's not a violent guy and he does not have a history of mental illness okay but if that were the case i would say quickly change your locks you know have pepper spray and I'm just curious, and I personally, by the way, I don't believe in sister self-defense classes. They're just a waste of time, all right? Why is that? <laughs> no, 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 no. Aslo, when no mara tamsik rajul tiglibu kid maash. Maafi. Forget about it. No, that's not true, Sheikh. Forget it about it. Why not? Let's not waste time today. Sheikh, inshallah, one day you'll, you will see the sister who will do that. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Yes, if you do it for years, you will flip any man in the world. I, I believe that. I'm not. يعني... So you're not about sister self defense class, but you are about sisters, for example, doing martial arts and training properly. Yeah, that but will, you're not that about the weekend. Effective. You're not about the weekend that class weekend at the masjid. Just, just go home and watch movies. <laughs> Don't come and learn to flip a man in one day, one hour. Okay, sisters, he comes like this, like. <laughs> <laughs> this one guy, he said his wife took this double weekend the self-defense and stuff. He said, okay, I'm going to attack you hard. Okay, yalla, show me what you learned. He said he flipped her, her arms were red for two weeks. Al-Muhim, I don't believe in that. You know what I do believe? I believe pepper spray. All these, there's a name for this kind of class. I forget what it's called. It's not self-defense, but it's like, it's not even preventative, but I forget what it's called. But how many sisters here have pepper spray with them, for example? Nobody? Well, they might, they might have more than pepper spray. Keep going. How many? Yeah, I was going to say, who's got a gun? Is that, is that uh, your wife? No. Nah. Oh, okay. <laughs> who's got a gun? Yeah, brothers, who's got a gun? Like on you. On you, my man, right there. Yes, sir. You know? 
Like, I don't know, man. These things are a big deal. But yeah, change the locks. Have pepper spray in like four different locations. Guy comes, spray Abu Ahlu. The minute he opens the door, you know. <laughs> but just these are issues I think are also important. I think, okay, I like the idea. The point is it's so important for our, for us to learn, have a sense of security. Yes. It, it doesn't matter even if it's not a uh, pepper spray or anything like that. But there is a sense of, you know, you have to be aware of when you sense dangers. But don't be like exaggerating to live in fear, constant fear. But there is a, Sahib al Malik, there is, you know, he, he, he cares a lot about security. You have to develop that sense of security. You know, I can, I can sense that this is not safe. This is not right. This is the, that's important for you to protect yourself. We are in, in a society where guns are very available, where a lot of murders rate in Houston is going up high. You know, rob, robbing, uh, being, you have to develop sense of security on how to protect yourself. Uh, that's also an important element. And, and by any means, do not, uh, any, this has not to do with the incident in itself, yeah. you know, saying, oh, she doesn't have some security or not. But there is a certain type of, that's a something to learn and to protect yourself. You know, like, like for instance, when you hear about some of these mass shooting, here's somebody walking with a gun, and everybody just laying down in the mustard or in the, in, the, in the place, and he shoot them one after another. Everybody just waiting for them to be done. I mean, you've got to die, God dies. Just attack the person. You see uh, what I'm saying? There's like an escape, uh, you know, uh, uh, exit, uh, exit. Just run. So that sense of security is important for us to learn. We heard the mass shooting in Buffalo, for example. You know, it, it, that, there is a, when things happen, it is hard. I understand that. I've been in a position close to that, where I saw death was so near to me, you know. Uh, so, I know how panicking this is, how hard for you to put you, but that's where training comes, and we're talking about doing drills, for example, from the masjid for mass shooting and stuff like that, in the school every year that they do it. Uh, these are good things. Read a little bit about some of that defense. I disagree with Sheikh Kamal. I think even the two hours uh, or, or so defense course can help. Not necessarily to flip a man. They should run but for two hours. You don't need to flip a man. You just kick him in, you know where. So uh, and you will be able to protect yourself, you know, or a brother also. It's not only for sister, for the brother also to know how to protect yourself. You know, these are even basic things like this important. And I think developing sense of security is good idea. Uh, I, I think the developing sense of security is huge. Huge, and I also want to put a challenge also to the brothers as well. A, a lot of times they're um, unaware. So you know, I have one brother who deals with security a lot in the masjid, and he he was he was venting to me. He said, "I see these brother walking down the block towards the masjid, and their wife is half a block down behind him, and he's on his phone and he doesn't care, and he's just walking ahead to the masjid." It's like, dude, walk with your wife. Pay attention to what's going on in your family. Um, another brother, I remember. There's kids running around. Yeah, there's kids front running of the around cars. behind. Another brother, I remember, you know, we were at a restaurant and everybody left the restaurant to go pray. And there was like 20 people, it was an event, and 20 people came. And then the brother's walking in because it's hot. Meanwhile, his two own sisters are standing outside praying, and everybody had left. And I'm like, what are you doing? Go back, you better go outside and wait for your sisters to finish praying and then come back inside. And he was like, Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. Be a, <laughs> like, what are you doing? That's yeah, a good you idea. Can't, you, you, there's no way that you're going to leave your sisters outside in the parking lot praying in the dark by themselves just because you wanted to come back into the AC. Like that type of situational awareness is something that I really like what the, the U of H MSA does. This, you know, the brothers created a, this whole program of walking sisters. To uh, you know their cars and train stations and things like that at night after sunset. I, I believe the and they have all of these mechanisms to protect that you know and, and all of that type of stuff from any sort of fitna. But the idea of just being protective over your sisters is something that's very important. And here we're talking about just even as as guys, it's like who are you protecting? Like who are you, you protecting? You know, Beyond sense of security. I know if, if a case where a sister complaining and she was saying 
you know, about my ex is dangerous. He can harm me. He can harm my kids. He threatened to kill my kids. He threatened to kill me. And just uh, she said, no, inshallah, everything will be good. There's no sense of security. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And even the sister six years ago, the judge even gave joint custody for, for both. For, and she, when she, she said she's going to marry someone else, the husband was telling her, you, my kids will never be raised by someone else. I would rather them die dead than someone else to be with them. Mm-hmm. And guess what? He killed his children. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how this judge yeah, he can live with that. Oh. You know, he granted him a, a custody. A, even with that threat. But my point is, there is sense of security is, is a very big issue here. You know, you know, somebody make a threat, don't take that lightly. For me, if I ever hear anyone in my community here making a threat about somebody's life, I report that immediately to the police. And same thing, if you are in a domestic violence situation or your husband, your wife threaten you, you know, I'll report that. I, there's no joke about that. If you said, I'm going to kill you, there is no joke about that. This but, is real. I got to add like two quick stories. One, can you this, hold on? He's uh, standing. No, hold the hold the Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله هيا للصلاة هيا للصلاة هيا للفناء هيا للفناء الله أكبر الله أكبر لا This brother, the, someone came to the masjid, this is at Fajr, and it's like, I don't know if he was high on drugs or intoxicated or something like that, but he's getting very, like, uh, very aggressive, and there's one brother only stopping him at the door and talking to him. And he says, every other brother would just walk right past me, go, like, pretend like they didn't see, they didn't say salam, nothing, and just walk straight past me in to pray. And I just, I have to deal with this guy by myself. Like five or seven guys just walked by. Why didn't any one of them like stand next to him? So that's, this is the other issue that I don't, there was also another masjid where uh, there was So like, they saw an aggressive, possibly dangerous situation and everybody deal with just it. left him to deal with it and just yeah, left where, him alone. There could have been seven standing next to him, but they all walked in. And that's masjid, neighborhood, street. You just don't walk a while like yeah. that. You don't put yourself in danger, but you don't just... You don't leave your brother in danger either. Uh, the other one is, the uh, there was a physical altercation in the back of one masjid. Like this one guy, and they were, he, was, <laughs> he was getting beat down. The point is that, the guy said later on <laughs> in the cameras, I'm watching what happened, the reaction of everybody else. He says there's a guy reading Quran like this. The fight starts, <laughs> he looks back. <laughs> And I'm, I'm not here. Come on, man. Like 10, 20 people in the masjid, not a single one of them wants to get up. What's going on? And a shame. Well, I'm looking at Anyways, uh, uh, you, uh, yeah, I'm sure you, 
I, I saw some of these videos on YouTube, stuff like that. Someone like, for about 20 minutes, or for 10 minutes, let's put it, okay, 10 minutes, he'd been like threatening, shooting someone, another person in the street, and not a single one in the whole neighborhood did anything. Yeah. Not he call the police, shout, do something, like, uh, if there's a gun and there's involved, I, I think you should be protecting yourself. That's, I'm not saying put your life in danger, but, but just don't just go as if there's nothing. That's not my business. Hmm. No, he's a terror. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know. Well, I saw this, this video, this guy stabbing this girl maybe 30 times in the La chest. Ilaha and everyone just pulls their phone out to document it for CNN. La ilaha illallah. Khalas, and nobody, j throw your shoe at him, you can try anything. Anyways. Do something from that one, one day self-defense class. The point is, Sheikh, um, you know, recently someone posted something about uh, suicide, right? And of course, we understand suicide related to some kind of depression, mental illness, stuff like that, right? But what happens is uh, they take the story of the companion who committed suicide when he cut his fingers, and then they put it out there, and then they said, you see, he went to Jannah, and the comments were like, yes, this is, this is the rahmah that we need to hear about in Islam and all that. So, I don't know, it seems like people just went overboard with this one example as if, and Allah understands the situation if you kill yourself. So, I'm not familiar with the story of the person who killed. What I know the Prophet ﷺ said about the person who, from Bani Israel, who cut his hand and bleed until he died. Then the Nabi said, he's in hell fire forever, or he's in hell fire cutting his own hand. Mm. The so story is it's authentic. It's reported by a Muslim, Tufail ibn Amr al-Dawsi. He says that when he migrated to Medina, yeah. his father migrated with him, and his father was a companion, and his father, um, the hadith says, fajazia. like he got sick, and then he got fajazia. And then this phrase becomes translated as everything from anxiety, mental illness, disturbance, all of that type of stuff. So he cut his hand, and then he, he, he died. He bled until he died. And so he saw him in a dream, and in the dream, he, his hands were covered. And then he said, what did your Lord do with you? And he said, uh, my Lord forgave me because of my hijrah to the Prophet He said, what about your hands that they're covered? He said, my Lord said he's not going to fix what I, I, okay, I, I okay. corrupted with yeah, my hands. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, okay, I remember. Killing yourself, okay, it, it, there's two types of people. A person who is mentally capable of making the right decisions or sound decisions, and he has the basics mental um, capacity, okay? That person killing yourself, killing others as well, is one of the greatest sins in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not kill yourself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran that whoever kill an innocent soul, as kill all humanities, and also in hellfire forever, for a very, very long time. That's what forever means here. Also, uh, killing the Prophet said the worst sin is to commit shirk than to kill your own child, like what we have here. Uh, uh, and to kill someone it is a great sin. It's the greatest, one of the greatest sin in Islam. So definitely it is. And in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if somebody stab himself, he will be in hellfire stabbing himself. Somebody po poison, uh, consume poison to kill himself, he will be drinking that poison in hellfire. So committing suicide is a major sin in Islam. But this is for someone who have the capacity to, or the basics mental capacity. But if someone is diagnosed as someone do not have that basic mental capacity, okay, somebody uh, does not have the basic mental capacity, like somebody will medically seen as someone who is insane, this person are not accountable for their actions. Not accountable for their actions. Rufi al qalam an tharat. Al qalam is lifted. So if that mental illness, but not every mental illness reaches that level, I want you to be very careful because 
You know, depression, for example, different levels. You know, uh, uh, somebody, for example, used drugs and holes in, or drunk and commit a, a, a not mentally capable of making, he's still accountable for their action. But somebody, there's levels. That's why the judges and the scholars it will have to investigate, like for example, this man who, who died. We have to differentiate if he is, if we have a trustworthy doctor say that this person is not, have no basics of making any decision. This is someone who's completely 100% is insane. Him and a child on the same level. Sheikh, as a community, do we pray over him? Okay, so uh, I'm coming to this. So that's something versus no, someone who is have uh, anxiety and going through the ups and downs and stuff like that, but he's still capable of legally and everything he came, who is responsible for their actions. There's two different cases here. I don't know. We don't know this person. What is he? That's why Allah will judge that person in the day of judgment. Allah knows what's really his status is. So if the person is mentally completely un, like excused, this person should be treated you know, like any other Muslims. But if someone who is, no, he knows what he's doing, he's a violence, he's this, he's that. Yes, he snapped, everybody snapped. But that's, he's still capable of making that decision. He will be held accountable for their actions in the dunya. So in this case, this person have committed a major sin. And the people who committed major sins, and these major sins are so severe like this, killing his own children, community member. Also, this is qatil ghila. When you kill someone while those people don't expect any harm from you, you, sub you stab them kind of to their back. Those people, their janazah prayer must be performed on them, but not by the imam, not by the leaders of the community or the mass of the community, but individuals among the Muslim community must make salat al-janazah on this person because he's still a Muslim. Even if he killed all those people, even if he killed his own family, he will not be put in his grave without washing the body, without putting the kafan, without someone praying on him, even if it is one or two. That's why in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he himself did not lead funeral prayers on someone killed himself or someone in the beginning in Islam and someone who in death, but he will ask his companion to do so. He will let someone else do it, but he himself will not do it. So from this, we, ulama rahimullah said, in a case like this, so that person who died, and that shows you how much, subhanAllah, this religion is very pragmatic too, and very, you know, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so massive. Yeah. You don't put yourself God, please, don't know when play that yeah. role. But is that person who will announce Salat al-Janazah on him and everybody? No. Okay. Terrible. It just uh, a few brothers go bury him, and before we, they bury him, have, they pray. We him. have three minutes, Sheikh, and there's a topic that I really want to address before we finish. Do you say, Alhamdulillah? You don't say, Alhamdulillah, uh, uh, out loud as a form of praising, but, Alhamdulillah, like any other Muslims. Okay. The issue of prying for more information when any of these events happen. So-and-so died, committed suicide, so-and-so died suddenly, then you start hearing it might have been a drug overdose, it might have been this, and then people start prying the family for more information. What uh, advice do you have, Sheikh, with regards to that? We, <clears throat> How do you balance being there for the family without being that person who's trying to get information from, from the family? From the family? Uh, yeah. Then you're not being there for the family. And if for God's sake, if someone's gonna go offer condolences just so he can get more information, just don't go, stay home. Uh, because, and sometimes people don't wanna talk about these things, you know? And, and to everyone who walks through the door, you know, like there's this joke about the guy that the, 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 the crocodile took his leg off. And he's in the hospital and the first person, what happened? He tells him the story. The second guy, what happened? He tells him the story. In the end, he's like, he took my leg off, but I pray to Allah, I wish that he just ate me and, and I didn't have to answer all these questions. So it, just think of that, where everyone comes in and wants to know what happened and you're making them relive it. That's one. But, and then we talked about the idea at the beginning, but we didn't get yes. to address it, the filling in the gaps. Yes, so more importantly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya amanu, ijtanabu kathira min al dhan inna ba'd al dhanni ithm. O you who believe, stay away from a lot of uh, suspicion and assumptions. And it says, indeed, some assumptions are sin. You start filling in the blanks. 
And the Prophet ﷺ said, من حسن إسلام المرء تركه ما لا يعنيه That from the, like the sign of someone's good Islam is that they leave that which doesn't concern them. Because you get into that which doesn't concern you. And if it didn't concern you, that's, that's proof or indication that you probably don't have access to much information there anyways. So you start to fill in the blanks. You start to, to tell one, you know, fill in one story and then the next person makes it bigger and bigger and bigger. And just, and, he, and a lot of hearsay, because this is real, and, and a lot of hearsay and, and damage will be directed towards whether it's individuals in that particular community, whether it's leadership, whether it's organizations, whether it's family members, whether it's, right? There's a, there's a lot of yeah. real damage yeah. that can be directed by, by this type like of Like what gossip. happened in this masjid in Ramadan. Someone dialed 911 by accident. And then their phone died, so they couldn't receive the call back and say, sorry, that was a mistake. What happened? The rumor was there was a bomb threat. Like how do you go from accidentally dying 911 to bomb threat? How do you go from that? But that's what happens when people start filling in the blanks and then listening in. And then I was telling Sheikh Walid, I was telling Sheikh Walid that what's going on and then there's, there are already rumors about bomb threats and one lady was eavesdropping. She's watching me talk to Sheikh Walid, so she's listening carefully. She just heard the word bomb threat. <laughs> and she just went and spread it to everybody. Anyway, we're at 44 past, inshallah ta'ala, so we end here. Make dua for her. Yeah, continue to remember, inshallah ta'ala, to make dua for her. Can you pray for her? No, 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 go ahead. Sheikh, Sheikh wants to pray for her, inshallah. Okay. Um, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his names and attributes to forgive the sisters and her mom. Amen. And to give, uh, gather her with her child in Jannat al Naim. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give patience and uh, strength to her family Amen. and to our community and to those who've been uh, shocked by this uh, incident and to replace the community uh, with goodness. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us and our family. Amen. And um, uh, with this, I say, Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad. But uh, please, please, please take domestic violence so serious. Don't get angry. Don't let us things escalate at, at the home in domestic violence. Please take mental illness serious. Don't let it escalate. These are serious things, Can snap in any time, can flip, and can be very devastating as we have seen uh, yesterday. Thank you very much. Salaam